Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Tuesday. It is the middle of April, and we are in our first workshop for the month uh, for the Pre-Celerator program. And just to refresh your memories, the Pre-Celerator program is a accelerator program of Stubbs, Alderton, and Markleys, a full-service law firm located in Sherman Oaks, California. And we are their innovation arm and work with very early stage companies, usually in pre-revenue, pre-product. And we offer, as a differentiator from other accelerators, great legal services to our portfolio companies. And six months in our uh, co-working space here in Santa Monica, California. If you haven't been to it, please give me a ring, shoot me an email. I'd love to show you what we're doing. And if you have companies that uh, might benefit from our accelerator program, please make introductions. I'd love to meet founders that are looking to grow scalable venture funded companies. So with that commercial being done, I'm excited today to have one of my friends, uh, Anthony Gonzalez. Anthony and I have been friends for a number of years. I think we first met when he was at Biocom. Uh, he has had a myriad of experiences in the innovation and startup space. And today he's going to talk to us about one of my favorite subjects because I've been fundraising for years, the art and science of fundraising. So without further ado, I am going to uh, have Anthony start his presentation. So Anthony, take it away. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Len. I appreciate that. Welcome to the art and science of fundraising. Um, just a quick moment. I'm going to invest some time into you. So I would hope you would invest some time into me. If you can put your phone on airplane mode, close your email, mute your other notifications, and just be with me as we go through this together. I'm going to data dump a ton of information onto you. And if you're in the right mindset to receive that information, you're going to store it a little bit better in your long-term memory bank, which is what we're all here to do is learn something. Like all good presentations, it should have a summary. So I'm going to do that thing where they're in movies and then they stop the movie and the narrator comes in and explains what's going on in the movie. So that's one of those scenes right now. Every good slide deck should have a summary. When you tell someone the information they're about to receive, when they provide that information, they'll know where to contextually put that in their brain. So I'm going to lead with a little bit of all my personal philosophies because that guides so much about how I fundraise. I'm going to interject random pro tips. I'm going to explain kind of venture capitalism fundraising, and then most importantly, the art of actually pitching. Quick disclaimer, I am here representing no organization. I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone. I'm just an individual on my own free time here to pass along some information. I'm not a consultant. I don't have any billable hours. I'm not looking to win any business in that capacity. Um, so thank you for joining me today. I'll start off with a quote with uh, someone who I think is really cool. Uh, I feel so strongly that deep and simple is far more essential than shallow and complex. To me, this is a great slide, few words, lots of visuals, easy to understand, balanced. And I think a slide deck should look like a children's book. If your book is easy to get through, it'll be easy for the investor to kind of understand what you're doing. So focusing on me and what I believe in my personal philosophy, I think it's really important to understand your strengths and your weaknesses, what skills you have developed, what skills are underdeveloped before you begin your startup and fundraising journey. Because then you know what areas you can improve, what you can practice and what you can do more of. Another quick quote by Albert Einstein, only one who devotes himself to a cause with his whole body and soul can be a true master. For this reason, mastery demands all of a person. Fundraising requires mastery. It is a skill, and it is a skill you must develop. The following presentation is going to be geared towards first-time founders. I wasn't really sure who's going to be in the audience, so I kind of, you know, going through some basics, and they'll build on those foundations up and up and up. This is very much an interactive workshop and not a lecture, so if you have a question, let's dive into it. We can go on a tangent, and we'll circle on back. We have about you know 55 minutes to an hour here. We'll do Q&A at the end, but also feel free if you'd like some more information about a particular slide, let's get into it. So feel free to hop off mute for this next one. But quick question for you. Evolution favors the species that are most... 
Anyone? Adaptable. Adaptable. Thank you. Great answer. Very, very true. So just a little personal belief about myself. Oh, no. I am had a technical glitch. Stand by. I'm not sure what just happened there. But uh, my PowerPoint crashed, so one second. All right, boot back up PowerPoint, something's happened. All right, and let me go back to screen share. Nice comment, Kevin. Just making it light as possible. All right, sorry about that a little glitch. Some things hang up, hang ups happen. You got to know how to just move forward with things. All right, so here we are back in PowerPoint. Correct, adaptable is the answer here. Um, this is a clip of the Earth going around the sun. The sun goes around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, takes 200 million years. We all know how long it takes for the Earth to go around the sun one year. What this shows, we're kind of a rock floating out in the middle of space, floating around a bunch of other stars. And this perspective on reality is nicely summed up as an existential nihilist. And in my personal belief, life has no intrinsic meaning or value, except for the value and the meaning that you assign to your own life. In other words, I have mastered the art of being shameless because I just think we're all a bunch of monkeys floating on the rock in the middle of the space. And none of it really matters. And quick quote from the book, Sapiens, if you believe that life has absolutely no meaning, then any meaning that you describe to someone's life is simply just a delusion. So we're all just living in our own delusion here on this rock. And that's to empower you to not feel the social constructs of rejection. And I'm not here to proselytize my own personal beliefs, but rather share my perspective of how I go about fundraising which is bullishly and unabashed about interacting with someone and letting them know what I'm about, sharing that authenticity and saying, this is what I think we can do together. So you'll notice sometimes they'll get a little repetitive. That's very intentional because your first pro tip is tell them what you're gonna tell them, then you tell them again. You tell them what you're gonna tell them and then you tell them again. Repetition is a great way to imprint the perspective perception and the narrative you want someone to take away from a certain slide or a certain point. And so if you have your big reveal, your big punchline, say it a few times. Repeating that will help it imprint. So kind of diving into what a first-time founder should know, you need to have empathy. And empathy means you are able to understand and then articulate someone else's position. So I'm going to share some kind of 101 of a venture capitalist industry so you understand where these people are, what they do for work. So when you ask money from them, you understand what they're motivated by, how they document success, and what's important to them. So just a quick data point about most companies. From your inception to someone closing a Series A, there's a 90% attrition rate. Most investors use these figures to decide when they're gonna invest in someone. You should also know these figures and know, are you gonna be part of the 10% or the 90%? Most companies fail because they run out of cash. Cash is king. That's why everyone needs money because you need cash to continue development, no matter how good your idea, no matter how much money you have on your receivables, no matter what the situation is, you should all know, I call it your day zero. Your day zero is the day you don't have any more money. And you should know that day off the top of your head. So if you just raised a million bucks, your day zero is six months from now. One month later, it's five months, and it's going to keep approaching until that day zero comes, until you get another capital infusion. So know your day zero, know your numbers, understanding kind of the general business life cycle, how much people are raising. So the general startup equation is how can you accomplish your next milestone in the least amount of time with the lowest amount of capital? while minimizing your risk. Well, first you need to know what your risks are. Then you need to put a plan and a budget together that shows you are minimizing those risks within a time frame that will hopefully allow you to reach your next milestone so you can raise another round of funding and then do it all again. 
Once you close a round of funding, that just means you've gotten to the finish line of the next round of funding. It's not the end, it's simply the start of the next echelon. So let's dive into some of these echelons. We have various sources of capital. And the first source of capital, which you should all pursue uh, initially are grants and it's called a non-dilutive competition, startups, things at UCLA, you know, pitches that you might have at a conference. And so I've kind of outlined some, some grants that are available. Most federal agencies have their own SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, similar to STTR. Um, highly encourage you to look at those programs. It is non-dilutive, meaning they're not going to take away part of your equity in exchange for the money. They're just going to give it to you. Moving up that channel, we have kind of friends, families, and fools. I say that flippantly because you'd have to be a fool to be investing uh, the first money into a startup. That's why it's usually people who are investing with their heart, your friends and family. They're investing in you as a person, not so much your idea and your company. And moving kind of up the chain, we have angel investors. These individuals are investing their own money, which means they also have more freedom to invest in things that they care about, things that they like, and, and really with their heart. As you start to move into VC, PE, those are fiduciaries. They are investing someone else's money. So they don't have as much latitude to do things that they like, th that are something of their interest or their passion, because they have an acceptable level of tolerance with a pre-expectation of an internal rate of return that they need to hit. And they're legally required to follow their investment thesis because they have limited partners to answer to. So you can kind of think of them as like corporate handcuffs. Even though they may like to do something um, and they want to invest in you, they just can't because you don't have the what you need to be investable. A family office is an angel investor who is so wealthy that his angel investment is like a little business. And so those are kind of uh, don't fit neatly in the pie, but they can operate as either angel or a VC. If you kind of think about where these fit on like a portfolio allocation, if you were doing wealth management or advisors, I grabbed this chart off the internet and angels and friends and family were too high of a risk. They didn't even make the chart. They're a little off the chart. I had to add these extra on my own little chart. If you took like what is a typical investment allocation, you can see there's real estate and venture and hedge. There's no angel investing. Most fiduciaries, most wealth managers, most financial advisors are not going to recommend angel investments. So it's important to understand that when you're asking someone or you're approaching someone and you're asking money, who, who are the key opinion leaders? Who are the decision makers? And who are going to sway whether or not the person you're asking money from says yes or no? Sharing some data about just the industry in general, there is a lot of dry powder out there. When the cost of capital was cheap in during the COVID area, a lot of VCs went and raised some money. Uh, the amount of venture capital firms has just grown significantly since 10 years ago, and there is money to be raised. However, given the current market conditions, the critical mass required to be considered an investable company has definitely shifted. Valuations have come down and people are more pragmatic about where their finite allocation of their VC fund is gonna be deployed. And they wanna see some numbers and some hard things, some hard data points. Just a quick, Topic about valuation, just to clarify so some buzzwords you may have heard. Free money is how much your money co company is worth before you fundraise. The amount of capital you raise is how much you're raising. And when you add those two together, you get your post money value. So if you're having a quick elevator pitch, you meet someone at a conference, I'm raising 5 million bucks. He goes, great, what value? You would say 10 million pre, my post money would be 15. Just want to clarify that because sometimes it can get confusing and I don't want anyone to conflate those two terms. So I just threw a little slide out there. How much is your company worth? Great question. What is the price of a three bedroom, three bath house, 1500 square foot, 10,000 lot? I don't know. It depends. Like there is no right answer. It is just a comparative reference point to other companies that are at the same point, had raised money at the same time. And so the valuation discussion can be objective if you have an EBITDA and you've been in operation for many years, you have a PL statement, then you can get into an actual four or nine valuation and you can 
provide a third party resource that will kind of come in and tell you how much they think their company is worth. But similar to buying a house, you use comparables and you make a justification. We believe we're worth X because other companies who were worth X had simple, similar amounts of employees, revenue, relationships. And so the valuation discussion is helpful if you can justify why you are asking for that value. In my personal perspective, I don't like when someone doesn't know how much they're raising their value at. Oh, I'm raising money between an eight to $10 million valuation. All right, well, is it eight or is it 10? If you can't confidently and with conviction say, this is how much I believe I'm worth and here's why I'm justifying that, it just shows a lack of sophistication. And investors have a ton of opportunity cost and other companies do invest in. And your job is to show why you're the top tier highest echelon. Diving into just a general structure of what a VC is and where the funds come from. So when a general partner wants to raise a fund, he has to himself or herself go fundraise. They have to go talk to limited partners. This could be large traditional groups like a pension fund. This could be other organizations. It could be a family office. They need to go get money. And usually they do that by articulating an investment thesis saying, hey, I'm going to invest in industry L because I spent 20 years in industry L. I ran a startup in industry L. So I know L industry very, very well. Give me your money. I will go invest it on your behalf. I'll throw in a 2% carry and you know we'll kind of be in this relationship together. That's what makes them a fiduciary is because they're investing other people's money. Yes, I will be sharing the slide deck and the video at the end of this. And I have some links in here too. So you'll be able to kind of dive in it and go a little bit deeper. Just to share another industry buzzword, if you've ever heard of the term PortCo, that stands for portfolio, portfolio Companies. So it's cool to use lingo and industry jargon so you sound like you're in the know. So if you're talking to an investor, create how many, how many port codes do you have? What's your investment thesis? What kind of check sizes do you write? So I shared some numbers of this $100 million fund. It's $100 million because they have four LPs at $25 million each. And if I was able to look up their figures, I know that they invest between two to 4 million. So if I was only raising $500,000, I probably wouldn't want to go ask this person for a check, but it shouldn't stop me from reaching out and um, engaging with them. So when I do need two to $4 million, um, I would know how much money they have. So I kind of answered my own questions here. I got ahead of myself. Anthony, Anthony, yes, uh, there's a question in chat about valuation and the uh, it's how much have those comparable valuation metrics adjusted over the past six months? This is what you should use other public data sources for you. The valuations have definitely come down. I don't want to misspeak about something I'm not familiar with, but I know CARTA, C-A-R-T-A, -A, has phenomenal infographics. The infographic I actually showed was from CARTA and they change all the time. They just like go to CARTA, Go to their numbers. I mean, you can see them right here. This was just in a 60-day period. So if you go to Carta and you check out their other periods, use data to, to answer that question would be my, my best recommendation. And then there's a new question in chat. How do you properly value companies across various sectors, clean tech, bio life sciences, technology, where they make these bold predictions for TAM of 50 billion plus or even 3 trillion? Yeah, you know, what it comes down to me is I see a lot of bold predictions about TAM. What I want to know is well, what's your plan to get there and how much is that going to cost? Like you're saying your total addressable market is really big. It's like, okay, I understand that's an addressable market. What is your plan to get market share within that addressable market? Because it doesn't really entice me to say there's a big market. What entices me is showing you have a plan that's not going to cost the money and not going to cost the risk to get a wide market share within a team. And so it comes down to how much justification they have and their ability to execute. And if they have a proven ability to execute, and if they have the ethos to back up their stated goals. A lot of grandiose founders just come off as a little unsophisticated, a little nuanced. Um, yeah, so the acronym AUM, AUM stands for Assets Under Management. And that's just a way for financial advisors and other people to kind of share 
their book of business, if you were kind of their total portfolio. I think when you're using and thinking about comparables, you should be thinking about ways that you can justify you're the same way. And so let's say if you are doing a wearable and you said, well, when Fitbit was our stage, they raised money at a $10 million valuation and we are at their stage. So we should also be worth $10 million because we're the next Fitbit. So you don't even need to use startups that are the same age as you. You can kind of use time as a scale and go look to a successful company and go back in time and look at like, well, what money did they raise at what value at what phase of their company? Boom, I have a comparable in the market. Same thing if you're selling a house, you go on to some real estate website and you look at other houses that are generally the same size in the same zip code, different schools. It's kind of similar to real estate. Everything is, it depends. And it comes down to how good of a story can you tell about justifying why you are worth what you think you are worth with kind of some flexibility. You, want to, you don't want to be too arduous or too stubborn and show that you're not very coachable. It's helpful to also understand who you're talking to within the firm. And if an intern or an analyst reaches out to you, that's their job. Their job is to line up meetings with the associates and the VPs and the decision makers. Your job is to get to a decision maker. And sometimes you're going to have to take a meeting with an analyst and an intern. And maybe they are your gatekeepers and they're the ones who are going to welcome you through the gate. But if one of the gatekeepers says no to you, try to go to decision maker. Try to be bullish. Again, making sure that you know you're in their investment thesis, you're within their check size, you've done your due diligence, and you have a degree of confidence that you would qualify well to be one of their port codes. Just checking the questions real quick. Is it okay to compare a startup in multiple sectors? You kind of want to keep things constant, like a science experiment. You don't want to have too many variables. You want them to be generally the same size at the same age, raising the same amount of money within kind of the same order of magnitude. And there's a lot of flexibility. You get to control the narrative and the perception of how your company is received by what you convey in your fundraising journey. So it depends on you know, how grandiose and how aggressive or how conservative you would like to perceive yourself. But at the end of the day, just remember you're working with other human beings and you gotta treat investors like people. You build a personal relationship. Treat investors like people and build a personal relationship. Ask about their kids. Ask about what kind of hobbies they have. It doesn't have to be long, but you can say, what did you do this weekend? How are things? It's really helpful to humanize the relationship so people understand that you're both just doing your best effort and you're kind of all on this floating rock here in the middle of space together. Um, the fundraising outreach process is high, high volume. I see this fallacy of a lot of people who say, oh, I had a great investor meeting. Oh, you had one investor meeting? Like, well, what if they say no? It's like, oh, I, I hope that they don't. It's like, well, hope is not a strategy. You need to fill and stuff your pipeline with so many people that you are overcapitalized. You don't wanna hope someone invests. You don't have so many people on the back burner that if they don't invest, someone else is willing to come on in. And so I stole this little graphic from someone else just to kind of give you uh, kind of these attrition rates. The attrition rates are, are really misaligned. Um, you know, I would say if you're reaching out to 300 people, you should expect about three to five investors. Just to explain, you know, this last side, the end of this is a signed term sheet. What the heck's a term sheet? People like Len and their great law group can actually give you the legal answer. I'm going to give you my layman explanation. It is a non-binding contract. It means it doesn't mean anything. It is a summary of bullet points on a piece of paper. Just because you have a term sheet does not mean you've raised money. It means you've agreed to a set of bullet points. Your name, how much the company is going to be worth, liquidation preferences, voting rights, if the founder can give himself a raise, if they have an investment policy. It doesn't mean that you have a contract. It doesn't mean the money is going to come through. So if you do not have the money in your bank, you do not have the money. If you don't have the money in your bank, you don't have the money. I've seen way too many founders get to the term sheet phase and then let off the gas pedal. 
And boy, is that a mistake because when it falls through, it is crushing to them because they didn't have anything else in their pipeline because they hoped that everything would go well. But they didn't plan for if it didn't. And then they're in a lurch and then they're running out of cash. And now they have to do a down round or a much lower valuation because they're desperate because they didn't play their cards right in the hand of poker or fundraising. So I share this due diligence term. Again, I'm assuming everyone's a first time founder. So I apologize if this is a little sophomoric and kind of uh, um, understandable, but just wanted to share some things that come up in due diligence. So conflict of interest or do they have another port co that is similar enough where they might be investing in your competitor or, or vice versa? Your team, are they um, based in the US? How long have you guys been working together? Do you have money in the bank? Is there IP? What are your plans for the next three to five years? Red flags are, do you have a lawsuit? Do you have a bankruptcy on the books? Do you have any, I don't know, pending court charges? ESG, environmental, um, and a good, I forgot the acronym. So ESG is the Environmental Sustainability and Governance, I believe. And then they may even go as far as doing customer calls and reaching out to the people who you said you've done business with and asking. But at the end of the day, they're doing this because again, they're fiduciaries and they're investing other people's money. And if they didn't conduct proper due diligence, they could be considered liable to being negligent. Since most people don't know how much their company is worth, there is a great way to get around this. There is a safe, which is a simple agreement for future equity, which is one type of investment vehicle. There's also a convertible note. And that is an agreement to not define the company's value today. However, sometime into the future, when the company's value is established, it will have a criteria, a cap, a valuation cap, meaning that even though you've agreed the company isn't worth, or you haven't agreed on the value, you will agree it is worth no more than X. In this particular example, X is 5 million. And I've kind of done the math here for you. So if you want to bust out some arithmetic, again, I'll be sharing this slide. So if someone invested in a $100,000, 20% coupon, 5 million vowel cap, 8% interest rate for three-year term. The worst case they would be in is $175,000 worth of value, which comes out 3.14%. I'm sharing all this nitty gritty stuff for you and because sometimes people like to talk quickly. So it's really helpful to have your jargon down. A coupon, also known as a discount rate, is the compensation they're being paid the risk they are assuming during the time frame in which the value of the company hasn't been established. Equity should always be reserved for risk takers. If someone is not assuming risk, they shouldn't be getting money. So just on a personal note, like if an advisor wants money or equity from you, they're not in it for the right reason because it, it takes no risk to advise someone. So why would they get equity for advising if they're not assuming any risk? If you're not a risk taker, you shouldn't get equity really protect that equity, protect that cap table, because in the future, you're going to have to justify who and why someone is on your cap table. And you don't want to look amateurish by saying like, oh yeah, when we were really early, some guy said there'll be our advisor for 5% of the company and he hasn't really been around these days. It's like, well, that's a red flag if I'm in due diligence and I see that on a cap table. All right, let's put on our thespian caps. Let's slow down the pace of this conversation. I'm a little caffeinated, I'm a little excited, but it's really important for you to understand that so much of fundraising is a performance just as much as it is like a logical mathematical proof. And so when you think about your fundraising journey and telling your story, you should have a written script. You should pretty much know what words you're gonna say on what slide. However, you don't need to feel obligated to say them verbatim because no one knows what your script is. So you don't have to read it line for line, but don't try to just wing it and improv it. When you have that written script, it allows you to practice again and again and again. And through that repetition, you will form strong muscle memory. Your brain will actually myelinate around the axons of the connectivity of the words that are coming out of your mouth, what the layman's term of muscle memory is, your brain will physically form stronger electrical nodes to communicate that information 
through repetition. That's why drilling is so important. I coach high school wrestling, and the best way to convey information is to teach someone a technique and then drill that technique into them, if and only if they're doing the technique correctly. Repetition is key. And so I really, really encourage you, if there's any opportunity to pitch, go out there and do your pitch. What do you have to lose? It's another way to practice your pitch. I know I'm not following my own advice on this one. It's because I don't have a standing desk. But if you have the chance, never pitch sitting down. Energy is contagious. Never pitch sitting down. Energy is contagious. People can feel your energy, even if it's in a Zoom setting. And when you stand up, your diaphragm has more air to push through your lungs. And that energy can be contagious. You can be people riled up and excited. Another way to get people excited is to understand your brain state. At the beginning of the presentation, if you notice, I asked you to take 10 deep breaths. It's really important that when you're gonna be in a presentation mode, you're in your creative state of mind, a theta brain wave. That creative state of mind can come through playing some games, through controlling your breath work. It allows you to view things from a different perspective and also be more receptive to new information. Your anxiety state is also useful. If you have a deadline, if you need to get something finished, if you've been procrastinating, the evolutionary adaptation of anxiety is what keeps people safe and worried and concerned. And you know it is a, another healthful state. So if you are anxious, channel that anxiety into something that produces a material and objective output, working on something, crunching your numbers again, focus. So know your mind states and then know what activities to be doing in those mind states. So if you're anxious, probably not the greatest time to be designing a slide deck, okay? I've included a link to some more research if you'd like to learn more about mind states and those uh, types of neurological research. I am a big believer in this concept of tribalism. Human beings evolved in small bands and collectives, and we naturally have this proclivity to us and them and tribes in which its members are honored to belong have the strongest interpersonal connections. Do you see this in football teams? Do you see this in samurai or knights? Do you see this in all different modalities? If you're honored to belong to a tribe, you are really in it. I know some football fans out there who are going to a football game this evening, and if you've ever been to that crowd section uh, of, of a, a football match, you kind of feel that oneness, that omnipresent collective. Your job as a founder is to get people to join your tribe. Not so much from the investor perspective, but for when you hire. You are selling and proselytizing your mission to solve a problem that is important to you. And you need to create this feeling of a collective that they get to be a belonging of and that's something they would be proud to belong to. Much easier said than done. All right, moving on to Aristotle's modalities of persuasion. Ethos, pathos, and logos. We've probably all heard of these before. I'm gonna walk them through what that means in kind of a fundraising experience. Your ethos are your credentials, your education, your experience. Your pathos is how you carry yourself, the passion, the grit, the determination, the faith you have in your mission. And your logos are your books, your Excel spreadsheets, your financial modeling. And so let me give you three different examples of like the first 30 seconds of a pitch using each one of these. So we'll start with ethos. I am a Harvard graduate. I went to Stanford for my master's and I have a PhD from Caltech. I've been working for 25 years. I've had two successful startups. I'm a high net worth individual and I'm excited to tell you about my third company. Well, that's a ton of ethos right there. Ton of credibility, check, 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 check. Pathos, I'm excited to tell you about how I'm going to change the world. I am excited to help people. I have a deep level of conviction and I would do anything 
to solve this problem that means so much to me because I believe other people out there are suffering and I don't think they have to. Conviction, determination, faith in the problem they're solving. Logos, investor, I know you like making money and I'm here to make your job easy. I've been making a million dollars annual recurring revenue. I have five full-time employees. I'm raising $5 million. And with that, we expect to make on average half a million dollars per employee and grow up to 10 full-time employees within the next 18 months. That last one is nice because it doesn't matter what industry or what business I am. If I can go on there and just spit some fat numbers, people are most likely going to invest. Obviously, that's way easier said than done to just have a million dollars ARR. And if you did, you probably wouldn't be raising money anyways, but it shows you that you need to have, you don't need to have, you should have two of these. And when you have logos, it trumps everything. If you're making a ton of money, you don't have a bunch of employees, you have a little risk and you don't even really, really need the capital that you're fundraising. Those are more investable companies, but you can, and I have personally raised money just on ethos and pathos. You, you don't always need to have the numbers there. The revenue will come if you have enough credentials with enough grit to convince someone that the financial figures are sometime into the future and they will be achieved. So understanding all these in your pitch, it's important to understand the purpose of the pitch. Anthony, before you go on, I just yeah. want to make a comment on that last piece. Most very early stage companies have a challenge with the logos, right? Yeah. Because they don't have traction. And I hear you. Most institutional investors today and even angel groups are looking for that traction in those numbers. So yeah, and where point. we are in this market condition, logos is more important than ever and ethos and pathos are greatly diminished. Yeah. It's just the conditions of the market. <clears throat> but at least you know, you know what the rules of the game are. So then you need to know how to figure out how to get some money. And your money, your logos can come in the form of memorandums of understanding, MOUs, letters of intent, letters of support. So even though you may not actually have the money, if you show you have the pipeline and the strategy to earn that money, if and only if you get a capital infusion, it allows you to kind of dance around the fact that you don't have it in your bank today. Good, good answer. And then one other uh, comment someone brought up at the startup level it can be very difficult to create a tribal group of people you're honored to be part of. How do we create the feeling of honor to be involved? I think people like to work on problems that are personal to them. So let's say you were doing a cancer therapeutic. It would be helpful to reach out to people who have had that type of cancer and say, hey, this is a personal problem to you. Would you like to help solve this for others? And so it's finding a way to bridge the gap. Investors also like to invest in the things they care about. So it's your job to bridge why the problem you're solving could be them. And it's, it's kind of similar to um, letting them know and, and, and almost inceptioning something. So let's say I have Sarah. Sarah has this problem. And Sarah is like the 40 other million people in America who also have this problem. But Sarah could be your mother. Sarah could be your sister. Sarah could be someone in your immediate family. Wouldn't you want to help Sarah? So I took a problem that had nothing to do with Investor. I named a character and then I imprinted how that character could be someone closely in their sphere of influence. Yeah. I would also add to build tribalism or to build your tribe, join an accelerator. Um, well, create the tribe with an accelerator program, whether that's the Pre-Cellerator or Techstars or Y Combinator or 500 Startups or the Long Beach Accelerator or the yep. myriad number of programs that are out there that you can join to, to involve yourself with other founders, uh, with mentors and people that are interested in what you're doing. Yeah, community is helpful too. And then like finding what tribes you're attracted to and seeing what they do well. You know, I think a lot of tribes have uniforms. Well, I encourage most founders to like have company apparel and like wear it. Like if you have your logo, like you should have your logo on a little polo. 
because then it's very easy to identify who's in the tribe and who's out of the tribe because you look the same. And the power of a uniform is really important for getting ethos. I don't wear a vest and a tie all the time, but it commands ethos. It gives me credentials because I'm in a uniform. This is a banker uniform. It gives me more respect than if I didn't have it on. I might as well do it because I am using the cognitive fallacies to socially engineer the perception of how I want you to think about me. I think attaching celebrities is a great way. I know someone who just paid one of the Kardashians to tweet something and his business just took off. So like, if there's a way, if you know someone who has a large social influence and you can loop them in, and again, equity is for people who assume risk, so they're not assuming any risk, try not to give away your equity. But if you can slice them in on the revenue or some other area of the pie, that's a great way as well. Um, just bouncing over here, some of the questions. So in a down market outreach for the research provided future. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're in down market right now, you know, logos is gonna be more important than everything, but it's gonna be harder and harder to do, especially if you need the money to start making sales. Like when I was a founder, I had a widget and I had people who wanted to buy that widget, but I didn't have the money to make the widget. And then I went said, hey, investors, I need money to make these widgets. It's like, oh, well, how much money are you making? It's like none, because I need the money to make the money, right? So like sometimes there is a chicken and the egg situation. Might have to go get some non-dilutive funding. Might have to take out a personal loan. Might have to put some stuff on a credit card. Might have to take a bigger risk and double down on my bet because I have the pathos to see this through to the end while making sure I include my significant other, my partner in my decisions. I can't tell you how many times I've seen startups blow up because people were a little too selfish, took too much risk, and they didn't think about how that was going to affect people in their interpersonal relationships and lives. Quick pro tip for you. The purpose of your pitch is not to land an investment. It's to land another meeting. The purpose of your pitch is to land another meeting. It's that simple. You want to reach out to someone. You want to get them on Zoom. You want to get them excited so that they want to learn more. So how do you get started? You know, easier said than done. I believe in my particular strategy, it's coming up with this story and this plot. Your pitch should have a character. That character should have a name. And that named character should have an image and you should refer to them throughout your pitch. That character should have a conflict with a problem that they're having. And then you should also include your addressable market by saying, and X amount of other people also have that problem. That character and their problem needs to come to a resolution, which is your solution, what you're selling, what you're raising money for. And at the end, it's the call to action. Contact me to learn more. Contact me to dive into our P&L. Contact me to learn about our logos. So as a quick example, this is Charlie. Charlie hates poor internet. Over 400 people, people also have problems with bad internet. If only there was some solution for bad internet for people like Charlie. Charlie could be your brother. Charlie could be you. Charlie could be your cousin. Wouldn't you want to help Charlie if you had the ability and the resources to do so? Great. Hi, I'm Anthony, and I'm telling you about the internet provider, blah, 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 blah. Have the hook, have a character, give them a name, and then make that character relatable. And you need to bring the problem to make it the investor's problem. People invest in things they care about. So your job as a storyteller is to command a narrative in which they can see that the problem you're solving could affect them. Even if it doesn't, that is what you need to do as a fundraiser. So once you kind of have your plot, your narrative, your little character, then you can actually get in to developing some slides. So a lot of when I do my slide decks, it looks as simple as this with bullet points. I'll have a title and I'll have a few bullet points on there. And I'm just kind of like mapping things out. And you're asking yourself, well, who's going to be viewing this? What information do I want them to know? How can I condense it? So I'm using as little words as possible. When you have too many words, people aren't going to be listening to you. They're going to be reading. You can't read and listen. You don't want to cannibalize the intention of the people you're raising money from by having too many words on the presentation when you're trying to talk. Also, assume that your competition is going to see your slide deck. I know this because people sent me my competition slide deck. Didn't ask for it. It came to me. It happens. So just have a degree of confidence 
or don't have a degree of confidence that anything on there, find a public information, even though you've asked them not to. Be considerate if you know people are gonna be viewing things on a phone or a monitor. If you have a very detailed graph and someone's gonna be looking at a phone, it's probably not a good graph. I try not to include a PowerPoint presentation. I like to include a PDF because a PDF is going to lock things in place. And it's not going to ch change the font or the proportions, or if you open it up on a Mac versus a, uh, a Windows, it's going to look the exact same. So I highly encourage you to send a link, a link to a PDF. And ideally, if you can just record yourself like I'm doing with Loom, then you can send a video and it's a little bit more engaging. And what are they supposed to do with the slide deck at the end? Got to have your call to action. I think it's such a missed opportunity when people have a good slide deck and then it's like at the end, it's just like the end. It's like, oh, oh, what am I supposed to do with all the information you shared? You need to have that very clear. The reason that I'm sharing this information is because I want you to do X. And then so the X needs to be the call to action. You need to practice your pitch until you've mastered your pitch. Practice, practice, practice. Practice your pitch until you master your pitch. Every opportunity you have to pitch your company, you should be grateful to go do that because now you're one marginal time better than you were last. There are diminishing marginal cost to pitching. Each time you pitch, it costs you a little less, a little less energy, a little less stress, a little less anxiety, because you have done it so many times that each additional marginal time you do it, it becomes effortless. And when something is effortless, it's noticeable. You need to master your pitch. People can spot out masters even if they aren't a master themselves because of how those individuals carry themselves, how they communicate, and how smooth and effortless the information they have in their brain is conveyed to the recipient of that information. The only way to master your pitch is to do it again and again and again. So I want to give you guys a quick roadmap. This roadmap is important for your fundraising journey, so feel free to jot this down. Yes, that was a little bit of a joke. There is no clear journey to fundraising. And let me tell you, there are a lot more shoots than there are ladders. A lot of times people get a little bit of a ladder and they think they're on the up and up and they can take their foot off the gas pedal. And then they hit number 87 and they're back down to number 24. And that can be heartbreaking. It's often heartbreaking because they didn't have a contingency plan. And they didn't have other people in the pipeline and they put too many of their eggs in one basket and they hoped that things would work out. So I've shared a lot of big ideas, abstract concepts. Now I'm going to focus onto actual tools and actual things that you can do to kick off your fundraising journey after you have your story and after you have your slide deck. So what I like to do is I shamelessly reach out to people. So I will add them on to LinkedIn and I will say, hey, I'm Anthony. I want to connect, share more about my solution. We're seeking advisors and experts in the space. Obviously, you want to customize that who you're reaching out to. When they, If and when they do accept, great to be connected. We're solving X for Y. We have accomplished Z. We're raising money to address K. And if you'd like to learn more, here's more details. And then you just hit them with a link tree. And then within that link tree, you can have a, an abridged slide deck. An abridged slide deck is helpful because it doesn't include a lot of your logos or your financials. I don't include that level of intimacy about my company when I'm fundraising because I don't want them to feel like they have enough information to make a decision. Because part of what I'm selling is me and my charisma and my conviction, and my energy, and my passion. And that does not come across in a slide deck. And so when I was doing this, I got some feedback. Hey, your slide deck needs to include your financials in your market slide. And I didn't want to share that. And so I had a cheeky solution is in my bridge slide deck, I showed those slides. And then I put a big blurry thing on it and said, contact me if you'd like to have a meeting. So they knew that I had that information and they knew it was there and I wasn't showing it to them because I wanted them to meet with me if they want to learn that much about me. You can also include a, a little demo video, maybe some press. And then the classic 
is this self-scheduling app. You can use Calendly, there's .cal, there are a million different resources out there. But what this allows you to do is it allows you to then go to automation. So once you have this framework of engagement, outreach, and then self-scheduling, you can get to a point where people are just booking meetings with you because you are churning out such high volume of outreach and they're self-selecting if they wanna connect and learn more information that ideally information will pop up. So just to provide some details and some numbers of things for my fundraising journey, this image on the right, this is my actual outreach. And so what I would do is I paid for LinkedIn Premium. And just to make up an example, I would go to LinkedIn Premium and I'd say, show me anyone who has angel investor in their title with five to seven years of seniority that lives in North America, that's profile is in English, and it would give me a list of people. And they would come over to this other resource, growthx.com, and it would paste that list. And then it would go and it would do my messaging cadence automatically. It would reach out to them and it would put their first name in. And then if they accept it, it would automatically follow up with my link tree. And these are my actual results. So let me just go through this real quick. So for this first one up here, I invited 481 people, only 15% of them connected, and then 5% of those responded. You can see down here, this was at 45%. So whatever messaging I did to this particular population was way better messaging than I did to this 12% population. So you can do some A-B testing on what information you provide, what your hook is, and you also want people to self-select out. If they aren't really interested, it's like, please don't connect with me. I don't wanna waste my time. I don't wanna waste your time. You need to be clear, explicit, concise, but also have a good hook and say, and know that the things are kind of tailored to the population you're working out, working out to. And it doesn't only have to be for angel investors. Maybe you're looking for customers. Maybe you sell into high schools. And so you go look up principals in America and you're reaching out to principals and saying, hey, school principal, like we do something for schools. Would you like to learn about how we can save your school money? Click here to meet with me. So this framework and this structure with these two service providers, it can be used for fundraising, customer discovery, finding advisors, lots of different modalities. It is very easy to lose track of a relationship. And so I encourage you to keep your own client relationship management solution. You can use Excel, you can use Airtable, Monday, Zoho. I've actually built one in Airtable. And if you click on this link, when the slide deck comes out, feel free to use the Airtable I've already built out. It helps keep people in a pipeline and understanding where they are in the fundraising journey, whether you've reached out to them, contacted, pitch, whether you sent them the term sheet, whether they have access to your data room, whether they're wiring their money. When you're managing 40 to 50 relationships simultaneously, you need to be on top of your game. You need to know when the next time you need to reach out with them, who owns a relationship, who are the action items are, because that shows a degree of sophistication that you know what the heck you're doing because you have all your ducks in a row. So whatever CRM solution you choose to use, the most important thing is that you use it and you keep it up to date. If someone doesn't get back to you, following up is a good thing. Be respectful. Don't be following up every single day, but every couple of weeks, every 14 to 21 days, until they tell you to no, like a hard no or to bugger off or they're not interested, it is totally within your ability to stay on top of it. And sometimes people are testing you. They want, you're like, I'm going to see if this person follows up with me. They just want to see how much grit you have. It's like a litmus test of your pathos. So with all that said, I'm going to read to you one of my favorite quotes, just reading the highlights, but it is not the critic who counts. Do not listen to people who throw stones. There is no effort without errors and shortcoming. You will fail. You will make mistakes. There will be problems. But at least if you do fail, you will fail while daring greatly. And you should be proud of the journey you have chosen to be on. You didn't have to do this. You get to do this. The perspective and the context in which you view hardship will change how you view that experience, positive or negative. And so I encourage you to have a positive, optimistic outlook. I have been rejected over 1,000 times. I say that with a badge of distinction. That was over five rounds of funding, 
a $10 million series, a a million dollar seed, three seed rounds, incubators, accelerator programs. I should have a lapel. That's like, I got my thousand rejection mark. Like I was in the military, the boy scouts. I am proud of those rejections because I got the opportunity to tell my story and it's okay that someone wasn't interested. It's okay that they said no. That meant they said no at that particular day, given that particular condition of the market and where my company was at that phase. I've had people that said no in the past that said yes in the future because I followed up with them diligently and respectfully. I keep them updated with what we accomplished. And if someone did say no, I'm always the first to ask, well, what would get you to say yes so I need, so I know what my homework is. Oh, well, I need to see you at X million AAR. I want to see you have 25 customers instead of five. Great. So if I come back here with X million AAR and 25 customers, you would say yes. And they go, yeah, it's like, good. Then you know what you need to do. So if someone does say no to you or reject you, use that as an opportunity to find out what would make them say yes. And then ask them if they can pass you along to anyone who might be interested in this opportunity. A lot of my no rejection meetings led to a warm introduction to someone else. And it wouldn't be a good presentation if I didn't follow my own advice. So here's my call to action. If you're interested with engaging with me more, if you'd like to sit down for a one-on-one, -on -one, I encourage you to add me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter if you guys do the Twitters and um, feel free to recommend me to a, a colleague or a friend if you believe this information has been helpful to you. I am grateful for your time and for the investment you've made in this conversation. I'll kind of turn off the presentation now and we can hop into it like an open forum Q&A and I'll pass the microphone back to Led. Anthony, thank you very much. That was awesome. Uh, there are a couple of questions in chat that didn't get answered. So I just wanna go through them and make sure that we uh, make sure we answer everything. How does one assess the investors likely IRR? You can ask, which is a pretty easy one. Most internal rate of return for investment are kind of like industry standard. They're looking between 10 and 20% or 10 and 20 X. So 10 to 20 times worth what their investment was, depending on where they sit in that asset class. So when you're in PE and you're very late stage, your internal rate of return may only be three or five, but they're doing big volumes. It's like, oh, I'm going to put in 10 million. I want 50 million. That's a $40 million you know, return, but only 5X, right? However, if you're putting in 100 grand, you want 2 million return. That's only $1.9 million, but that's 20X. So the proportions and the dollar values, it depends on what asset class and where those investors sit on that little chart I shared. Thank you. And the follow-up question from Lamont was, any tips on managing liquidation preferences? I don't get too stubborn if someone is coming in as a lead and they are commanding a liquidation preference. Like the people who have the money have authority. So sometimes it's an ultimatum, sometimes it's a negotiation. So if someone says, this is my term sheet, here's the liquidation preferences, they're kind of telling you to take it or leave it. So in a negotiation, you should know what you have bargaining authority on and what you don't. And if it doesn't sound like you have bargaining authority on liquidation preference, you can then barter for something you do care about. And when you're going through a negotiation, there are two separate discussions. You have the economic discussion and you have the authority discussion. And you can take one modality that you've conceded on or capitulated on and use that to get a win in another modality. And so what do I mean by that? If someone is giving you an ultimatum on their liquidity preference, they're not asking to negotiate. But what you could say is, because I'm willing to accept that liquidation preference, I would like to make sure I don't have to come and ask you to hire a new employee. So I've taken something, a capitulation on the economics discussion, and I won a victory in the authoritative discussion. And those are two different topic points in the same term sheet. So try to always parse out the dollars and the cents versus who has control, authority, and veto power. Very good. Thank you for the answer. Are there any other questions? And you can uh, just take yourself off mute and ask you go, it. Stephanie, I see you. 
Oh, one more time. You're sorry. Am I still muted? You're good. Y'all can hear me. Okay. Um, thank y'all for having this because I've I've taken so many notes, but I have two questions for you. Um, one of them is it revolves around investments that are mainly investments in VCs um, that only invest about two percent um, of their investments into uh, black owned companies and same for women. And if you are a black woman, we're down to under 1%. Um, so how do I and other women of color, especially black women, how are we supposed to stand out and be trusted, especially when we're starting out? Um, so hold on to that question. Just hold on to that real quick. Then the other part is uh, as, as an organization that is starting out, um, if you don't have capital, but you have partnerships that are lined up, would it be helpful to have letters of intent from each person, each organization that you are working with in order to, to fundraise? So those are my two. Yes. As someone who is not a Black woman, I can't really speak too much on that, but I can kind of give you some general advice is it comes down to people who are bullish. And when you, when you don't have this fear of shame, and you command space, people are gonna respect you. And so like, I will do ridiculous things. Like if I wanted to talk to someone, I'll go like reach out to the ambassador of that country and say like, hey, can I hop on a call with you? There's a VC in your country and I wanna connect. Could you, could you introduce me to them? It's like, if the ambassador introduces the VC, they're gonna take that email, right? Like that is a ridiculous and crazy idea. But like, I'll cold call a CEO of a big company and say, you're successful. How did you get in your shoes? You know rich people, you're rich. Help me out, I need some help here. When you communicate your needs and your wants to your community, they know how to help you. My little phrase is the dog who barks loudest gets fed first. So if you wanna eat, you gotta bark. You gotta let people know you exist, how they can help you and, and what they can do to add value to you and then just be bullish about it and consistent and show that I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, to reaching out to other successful black women, I mean, that's your community. Tap into it, ask them how they got to their position. There are black owned VCs. There's a company called Black VC with no um, vowels and just go talk to those people. And, and again, wear with a badge of distinction. I'm a non-traditionalist. I am not a rich white man. I am not your cookie cutter CEO, but I am going to be one of your favorite port codes. But also using the jargon that they're familiar with will help you show that you're in their tribe. You're not an outsider. You look like them. You speak like them. You, you know their jargon. You're at the same conferences. And then consistency, if you show up at one conference and they see you at a, a, a Zoom meeting and then they hear about your name from someone else. And so be unabashed about how to get a hold of people and then drip on them. I have a question on that. If I could follow up on uh, Stephanie's question, Anthony, thanks for that answer. And Stephanie, thanks for the question. Um, I advise, I'm a startup founder, but I also advise a uh, startup that uh, is founded by uh, uh, Colombian Americans. And so there is uh, gender, cultural, and uh, language issues that we uh, constantly navigate with regard to, but they're just about to raise their Series A. And what I've uh, observed is that, yes, there is an immediate optics issue if uh, the investor sees that you're not a white male or you're not a 28-year-old you know, Asian male, Stanford grad. Uh, and uh, I'm going to put this in the form of a question. Um, would it help if the person of color, uh, especially if, if uh, she's the female founder, um, just doubles up on the rigor of the data? Uh, namely brings the data really uh, to, to throw the investor's optics off in the same sense of, a you know, uh, to distract away from any sense of optics and saying, look, the TAM is real, the SAM and SAM are real. Uh, you know, what Stephanie even said in the way of like the letters that they have would bringing uh, data with uh, attention capture potentially reverse just the one-on-one -on -one with, with who uh, she would be engaging in uh, to let them walk away thinking like, regardless of who I just spoke to, this is a runaway opportunity to bring me at least five to 10 X. 
Yeah, and logos trumps pathos and ethos. So like, you could be the most boring, uncredentialed, dry person, but you walk in the room and you're making $5 million AAR with three people, they're going to invest in you, <laughs> right? Like money is green, no matter what color your skin is. And so I would also, you know, focus on how you can call out negative messages and implicit biases and label them. I understand you're surprised to see me here today. How is a black woman, a CEO standing in front of you to ask money from you? This is probably new, but I'm gonna explain how I have the right team solving the right idea to help you look good for your limited partners. So I'm gonna make your job easy today. Oh, Just called it out, you labeled it. So I see a, que a question over here from Chris. Um, the only, th first of all, not a lawyer, so don't take legal advice from, from random guy in a tie. Um, but if you would like to take my advice, your biggest hang up is unaccredited investors. You are not allowed to solicit unaccredited investors. You're not allowed to do public solicitations without disclaimers. So I would stick away from being too bullish on putting something on Instagram or on LinkedIn that has a direct solicitation to unaccredited investors. And accredited investors defined by the SEC, I believe you have to have a million dollars net worth or over $200,000 in annual income for the past two years or $300,000 if you're filing jointly as a couple. So if you meet one of those three criteria, it's a self-accreditation process too. So if someone says, oh, I'm an accredited investor, you can kind of just take their word for it. It'll come out in due diligence. They'll sign off some waivers saying they are an accredited investor and they waive their rights and all these things. Uh, but no, you don't necessarily need to wait uh, and you can figure out documents on the back end. You can work with uh, Lens Firm and they can spin up some term sheets. If you have people ready and waiting, um, do not let documentation hold you back. With that being said, if someone says, yes, I'm willing to invest, the last thing you want to do is be waiting for Lens Firm to draft the documentation for you. You want to just have that, like, yeah, after this call, like send, 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 attach file. Like, here it is. It's over in DocuSend. It's in your inbox three minutes after they say yes. So, you know, I hope that's, that's a fair answer for you, Chris. Hey, uh, Anthony, thank you so much for this. And Len, too. I've known Len a long time, also a member of LAVA. I call myself an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs now. I try to find the best in class entrepreneurs that are next generation disrupting the status quo. And I belong to about 15 different uh, venture networks in Southern California, including LAVA, which is where Len used to be. Um, Tai SoCal, Expert Dojo, there's a whole bunch of them that are kind of under the radar. So my job is to represent the entrepreneurs so that they can have the best chance of getting in front of, you know, the money people, the investors. And most of the networks have way more entrepreneurs than they have investors. And so what I try to do is reach out to people through LinkedIn. I've created my own process for doing that. So I reach out through LinkedIn. And if I don't get a response from them in the next day or two, it's pretty much I can't reply to them. I can't respond to them unless they reply to me. So my actual practical question that would help me is, can I undo uh, that myself? Can I disconnect the communication or delete the communication so I can start over with them and others? Yes, you can. It doesn't allow you to add them for another 15 days or 30 days or something like that. So LinkedIn penalizes you. But I, I have a four touch drip, I call. So I reach out on LinkedIn and then I'll shoot them an email saying I'm following up to my LinkedIn note. And if I don't hear back from them, then I'll call them saying I'm following up to my email. All I'm trying to do is land a meeting, but I'm dripping on them. And they go, why is this guy trying to get a hold of me? If they tell me no, like I don't harass people after I've they've communicated back to me. But if they don't communicate to me, it shows a degree of grit. You know, I'll wait seven to 10 days, three weeks if I need to, but I want to be present in their reality. I want their my mouth, my name to come out of their mouth. I want them to know who I am. I'm commanding space. You can reject me, but you will know who I am. That's great. Thank you for that. Of course. If you're speaking loud, you're muted. Any, sorry. Any other questions? Actually, Anthony. Oh. Lamont, you have one more. Go for it. Okay. 
Uh, I have a follow-up question on on the um, internal rate of return and, and, and the other question I asked. I'm, I'm curious to know if there are also any tips that uh, Anthony might have on uh, the whole allocation of, of board seats uh, along with the liquidation preferences. Yes. So your advisory board is infinite and has no restrictions. You should, I call it board stuffing. You should stuff as many people on your advisory board. This is why Theranos raised a billion dollars because they had like a military general on their board. No reason. Why is a military general on some like cancer testing company? They're board stuffing. It, it shows ethos if you can get another successful person to say they're on your board. So one thing that I do to build up ethos is I say, go stuff an advisory board. So if you're trying to start a new airline, perhaps, you should have other people who've been executives in airlines on your advisory board. Great. Now you are just one above someone who doesn't have something like that. When it comes to your board of directors, that is a very coveted and very personal role. They have liability. They can be sued. They can be incriminated. They can go to jail. So much so that they may even require insurance. DNI or DNO insurance, director, directors and officer insurance is something that may be part of the requirement is for your board is saying, hey, I'm not going to be on your BOD because if you do something wrong, I'm not going to jail. So you need to insure me. So this is what I meant in the term sheet where you have two negotiations, the economics and the authority. The board seat is part of that authority. And you want to make sure that you have majority because the board is the boss of the CEO. The CEO is easily replaceable. The board just has a meeting and they go, we're going to terminate that person. Even if you're on the board and you're currently the CEO, very easy to lose your job in a simple board meeting. Doesn't take much than a few people to just not agree with you. And your company is no longer, you don't work there. You'll still own your shares. It'll still be, have the history had, but now they're searching for a CEO. Thanks. Um, what do you get away? What do you give away to an advisor on advisory bird? You give away gratitude and appreciation and maybe a bottle of whiskey or a glass of wine or a sports game or a loaf of bread from your favorite bakery. All right. All great advice. Thank you very much, Anthony. I appreciate you so much. I'm honored to count you as one of my friends and colleagues in this industry. You made it. And uh, you made it. That's right. I made <laughs> it too. Uh, it's a it's a win-win. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending today. I appreciate all of you.